Good evening. Thank you for the introduction, Kerry and Massimo. Thank you, President Father Peter, for being with us. Thank you all for uh, trying to spend time in reflecting, as has been said, in reflecting uh, and also in discerning and praying about this issue that has seen uh, for so many years so much damage done to the church but much more damage done to human beings when they have been abused, when they were victims of clerical sexual abuse and um, other kinds of abuse. Uh, and I would just uh, remind us of the presence of victim survivors among us. I know at least from one person, but if we take statistics seriously, there are many more here who have suffered um, grievous harm by the hands of clergy or in family or in public schools or in sports or wherever that was. So this is also something that we need to take into account when we speak about this topic. What I would like to share with you uh, are my reflections that uh, continue to evolve as uh, much as I travel and I meet people um, from one continent to another, from one country to another, from one discipline to another, and from one experience in a certain context, in a cultural setting, in a political and juridical system, and in a, a mindset of people. So what I want to present is something that has um, certainly been inspired by a meeting with many people who are engaged and committed to the same mission that is a safer church and a safer world. And I would um, detail that in the following points. The next stage, attitudes and perceptions, paradoxes that uh, we can find when we deal with this, something that has been called institutional traumatization, the meeting of the presidents of the bishops' conferences that took place 11 months ago in Rome, and something that could look like steps forward. And I, I need to start also by mentioning that yesterday, or today, if you wish, 10 years ago, my story with this topic started more precisely when I was in Ukraine and uh, in the university, by, in the Catholic University in Ukraine that was founded by the newly appointed Greek Catholic Bishop of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Archbishop Gudziak, who, whose clergy I will address tomorrow on the same issue. When I was in Lviv in Ukraine, News broke that on 28th of January 2010, the Jesuit director of a school uh, in Berlin had broken uh, ranks, so to say, and had um, publicly spoken about the abuse that had happened in that school. And that set off the second public wave of interest, I would say worldwide, after 2002, the Boston spotlight cases. Uh, so it is. 10 years that, uh, that we deal with this in uh, the central part of Europe. Uh, it has been 35 years in North America, if you take the first cases that came out publicly in Canada and then the US. So we have seen a lot of story passing by, but in 2018, we have entered into a next stage. This is my thesis. And this thesis is grounded on a number of events. The first in that year, 2018, was the Pope's visit to Chile at the end of January, precisely two years ago, uh, where um, he was asked to comment on the allegations of abuse against a Chilean priest with the name of Caradima. And uh, the Pope uh, reacted very um, angrily saying literally that this was calumny and uh, that he needed proof. And that was uh, the, 
reason for uh, a media uh, outcry and uh, shock to many survivors of abuse that had thought that uh, Pope Francis would uh, be a strong advocate for the case and um, it created a huge uproar and uh, criticism of the Pope. The consequence was that the Pope um, saw the point and he sent Archbishop Schikluna, the former prosecutor, chief prosecutor for the church, now Archbishop uh, of Malta, to Chile and he, Archbishop Schikluna, met 70 survivors of uh, that group of Karadima brought home a report of 2,500 pages. The Pope read that and he apologized publicly to the victims. He apologized for having used the word colony and uh, all his attitude. And uh, I know for sure that uh, at least one survivor from that group, a very prominent one, who lives not far away from here, uh, sees the Holy Father rather frequently since then. Um, what came out of that was a letter that the Pope wrote to the Bishop's Conference in Chile. So he was not addressing one bishop and one diocese and one case. He was addressing the whole Bishop's Conference. And he said, how come that over decades you had this abuse going on and nobody spoke up? And nobody interrupted, nobody accused, nobody reported. The response came also from the bishops' conference, not from the single bishops. In uh, May, the bishops wrote back with something that had never happened before in church history. As a body, as the representatives of the church in Chile, as the system church, at least in its highest representation, the bishops offer their resignations. All of them, 34. Now, for me, this is the turning point of, uh, of what we see now as the situation, how we look at abuse and the abuse crisis in this very moment of history. It has turned insofar as it moved away from considering one case, one allegation, one perpetrator, one victim, one bishop who was negligent or um, covered up, to what does the system take and responsibility and has to stand uh, in for as system. So we look since, uh, I would say, two years uh, into the ramifications into the system, the institution, the organization, church. And that is new. That wasn't there two years ago. Now, out of the 34, eight re resignations have been accepted. Two of those bishops uh, have been dismissed from the clerical state. Now, something very known, very much known to you, because it happened in this state of Pennsylvania, the grand jury report with those numbers, 301 priests uh, who were convicted because of abuse uh, between 1950 and 2014 in six dioceses with more than 1,000 victims, known victims at that point. But what was new was also something connected to my thesis. For the first time in such a kind of report, and we have had maybe 15 to 20 reports worldwide of that quality and of that standard, for the first time ever, such a report underlined the, um, the systemic failure, the systemic failure in the dealing with the abuse and the systemic failure of reporting, punishing, stopping, collaborating with, um, uh, with state and, uh, and church authorities. For the first time, that was put on the spot. Before that, also those reports were more or less 
uh, occupied uh, with the single cases and the single detailed numbers, but not with the structural um, responsibilities. More or less at the same time, a bit earlier, the allegations against the former Archbishop of Washington and Cardinal McCarrick came out, who was then dismissed uh, more or less a year ago from the priesthood. And at the same time, two verdicts were published, one against Cardinal Pell in Australia for allegations of abuse, and uh, against Cardinal Barbarin in France for alleged cover-up. Now, both trials are still on the way, but for the first time ever in church history, Massimo may correct me, but for the first time ever, we have cardinals sentenced by state tribunals that are not in a dictatorship or in a whatever uh, unjust uh, regime, in a liberal democratic state, for the first time ever, candidates, cardinals have been sentenced to prison uh, and, as we know, Cardinal Pell is still uh, in prison. So, um, this is something new that was not there, not even three years ago. So, the situation is changing and it's changing fast. The next stage has put the system church on the, uh, on the spot. And that sh sent shockwaves uh, throughout the US, certainly, and since then, this word of the double crises uh, goes around, and many people, um, if, if one can say so, more upset with the negligence by the leadership than with the abuse itself. So where were our leaders? I mean, this is what I get when I follow news and, and reactions from your country, especially, but not only. In the meantime, in Germany, we had uh, something similar to your John Jay studies. This is the MGH study with more or less the same results, more or less comparable numbers, and more or less the same background. Why could it happen over decades that abuse went on unchallenged and unreported and nothing happened? Nothing really happened besides some spiritual admonishment, etc. Uh, we have seen films coming out in Poland. Um, the situation in Chile is still very bad, maybe even worse than two years ago. Um, I've just been with the bishops in Peru, in Lima, uh, over the last weekend. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the case of the Sodalitium. So a lay-founded, lay-directed, new religious community where you have probably dozens, perhaps hundreds of cases of abuse, mainly spiritual abuse, abuse of conscience, also sexual abuse. Lay-founded, lay-directed. The director sits in, uh, or the former director, I should say, sits in Rome in exile, so to say, um, a lay person where, who abused uh, minors sexually and in conscience. We have seen over the last two years an increasing focus on the abuse of adults. Obviously, um, one of the eliciting factors for that was uh, the case of Cardinal McCarrick and his abuse of seminarians. Then the Holy Father spoke in one of his famous uh, in-flight conf uh, press conferences um, uh, about the abuse of religious women, which brought about um, the rediscovery we need to say the rediscovery uh, of this issue that was on the table 20 years ago. 20 years ago, nobody cared. Now it's here again, and I hope we, we continue to deal with it. But the impression, the overall impression is they still don't get it. And how could it happen for so long? What is new is that those who are, are targeted are bishops in general, 
cardinals in general. There is a general mistrust and suspiciousness. And it has also hit the Pope. So the untouchables have become the target of criticism, of mistrust. If we look into the Catholic Church, uh, we need to realize that uh, this is not something that is only happening in the US or in Australia, where the, the trust in bishops, generally speaking, from outside, from an outside perspective, is not zero. The level of trust is below zero. And this is devastating for an institution that is built on trust and on faith. So, um, what can you do in a, in a church that has 1.3 billion uh, members to which belong 24 individual, single, separate churches that all belong to the Catholic Church? Greek Catholic, Syro Malabar, Melkites, Maronites, whatever you have, with their own structures, their own synods, their own hierarchy, with about 5,300 bishops, 2,900 dioceses, uncountable religious congregations, in the Anuario Pontificio, so in the, in the big brick, red brick with all the numbers from, from the church. 200 pages alone list the names of the female congregations. The names of the female congregations, 200 pages. Then you have the Vatican uh, that has the universal oversight, of course, but is critically understaffed. In the section that deals with the allegations of abuse, how many people would you think work there? Yeah, exactly 18. One eight. One eight. Uh, AP had a report about four weeks ago where they showed the, the head of the section, uh, who is a, an Irish Monsignor with the nice name of Kennedy, John Kennedy, um, and he's complaining that they don't have, they don't have neither the infrastructure nor the personnel, uh, nor the competences in, in terms of um, the abilities to communicate with people by, uh, by all uh, means that would be necessary to proceed with the 1,000 new allegations that have come in last year. And then you have dicasteries that um, have competences for dealing with sectors in the church. I can't explain to you because it would take too much of time. But just one example, one example. How many dicasteries, ministries, you could say, in a, in a state government, in a federal government, how many of those dicasteries de in the Vatican, in the, in the leadership of the church, deal with the bishops of the church? Can you, can you guess how many ministries are responsible for certain types of bishops? No, no, sorry. <laughs> ministries, how many ministries? Huh? Okay, you have, you have the congregation for bishops. That is for bishops from the old Christian countries. And you belong to that. You have the, you have the congregation for evangelization of peoples. That is for the mission countries and their bishops. Then you have the Secretary of State, that is for the nuncios, who are bishops. Then you have the Oriental churches, all the Oriental churches, 23 of them, and their bishops. And then you have cases, um, uh, exceptional cases, uh, um, that are dealt with uh, others. For example, the, the Anglicans who become Catholics are under the Congregation for Doctrine. So you have at least five, five different ministries that deal with the same type of ministry in the church, that is, a bishop. What I want to say is, Catholic Church is much more complex than one sees and expects from outside. Second point, attitudes and perceptions. 
Many people have spoken, and the Pope himself is, isn't tired of repeating it, that clericalism is at the root of much of the damage that is done to the Church. And I would like to uh, show a few typical <coughs> attitudes that you find among clerical, clericalist clergy. The world simply doesn't understand us. I represent Christ and his church, and it's only me. The media attacks are a sure sign that we are following the crucified. I can take whatever I wish. I have renounced to so much. My vocation is to serve. I don't need anybody tell me what I should do. I don't need to justify myself. I'm accountable to God alone. Nobody shall criticize me. Now, whether this is the real attitude of somebody, and yes, you can find that, or it is projection, but very often, in victims of abuse, the the perception was that this is the attitude of this priest and of this church. Nobody can touch me. I'm above law. I can do whatever I wish and I can take whatever I want. In contrast, the perception of survivors, as I have listened to from many, <coughs> I'm livid that they push away their responsibility. Never ever anybody has listened to, my, to me, to my story, and to my hurt. I don't know to whom I can turn for support. If only I had not been so powerless. I had blind trust in Father X. I couldn't imagine that he could do anything evil. I've struggled, I've struggled so long, I give up. I feel so dirty and guilty. If only they had the courage to confess their crimes and do justice to us. These two, the attitudes and the perceptions, the clerical attitudes and the perception of survivors and victims, are universally present. And in that sense, you can find the same, the same state, the same attitude, the same um, reality across the globe. And yes, there are many things that are very similar or equal, the same, from one country to another, from one continent to another. And there has been a, the creation of a culture of clericalism that has certainly not stopped, but in many cases promoted abuse. And there has been a culture of neglect, denial, rejection of survivors of abuse, fear, and um, the, a, a, a huge uncomfortableness. And that has translated in, um, in many other behaviors that were harmful and are harmful for the mission and the testimony and the credibility of the church. However, over the years, I have come to discover what I would call paradoxes. It is clear, I, I don't want to say with the word paradox that I, I, I want to take away anything from what we need to give to survivors and uh, to victims of abuse and to their families 
to their friends, to their partners. <coughs> but when we talk about sexual abuse committed by clergy against minors, we don't talk only about sexuality and misbehavior in sexuality. We talk about much more. And we talk about a much broader and much more complex picture. And that is what I want to address with this part now. Because in the church, we have at the same time victims and perpetrators. It is true, a good number of victims have left the church and can't come close to any thing churchy. But I believe, I don't have numbers, but I believe that a great majority of victims of clerical sexual abuse are still members of the church whether they go to Mass or not. But if this is the body of Christ, and we are all members, and if victims of abuse still belong to that church, then there are members of this church who hurt. And at the same time, you have perpetrators. Maybe a few have left the church. Many of them have dis been dismissed from the priesthood. However, most of them are in the church. So we have criminals, convicted criminals in the church. Victims and offenders at the same time. We have prosecutors, the judges, and all who have reported. And we have superiors, means provincials, generals, bishops, who have covered up, who were negligent who until very recently, and maybe even today, move perpetrators from one parish to another, from one school to another, from one province to another, from one continent to another. This is the reality of this church. We have safeguarders and those who downplay the necessity to talk about it. It's enough, people say. Let us talk about something different. So, we are one church, as we profess in the creed, one Catholic, holy Catholic and apostolic church. Don't we say so? All the more it is surprising that very little knowledge, expertise, experience is passed on from one local church to another, from one country, from one bishop's conference, from one province in the same order, in the same congregation, to the other. It's astounding. It's astonishing. Why do one bishop's conference after the other need to repeat the same mistakes as the neighboring one? So where is the oneness? Where is the unity there? Then, as I said before, clericalism is one of the reasons. And clericalism among clerics and non-clerics. I've learned this from certainly not cleric, school teachers in Australia, so lay people, school directors in an archdiocese where I gave a workshop. And when I spoke about, very eloquently, about uh, clerical, clergy clericalism, they said, what you describe we find among ourselves, clinging to prestige, role, not being wanted to judge, be judged by others, evaluated by others. I can take whatever I wish. This is not only reserved for clergy. And the fear that is created when one belongs to this particular group uh, to, that promotes each other. Uh, so the same mechanisms happen among clergy and among non-clergy. Then people think the Catholic Church is all-powerful, it has been all-powerful. Now, that is true to some extent that certainly you have had an image and you had behavior that was very authoritarian and it is connected to the role, to the position. At the same time, you have also a, a quite diffuse and contested uh, expectation and experience of uh, authority because 
the church as other organizations, big ones, really big ones, is not a monolithic block. To the contrary, the closer you get, the more you see how diverse the cultures are, how different people's uh, spiritualities are. And you see that, for example, the impression that the Pope could press the red button and all bishops in the world would salute <laughs> and would follow his order. You can see how this works. You can see it in your country. <laughs> two years ago, not even two years ago, I mean, uh, you saw an explosion of opposition against the Pope and nobody intervened from among the highest ranks of hierarchy. So, the Church is not uh, organized like a pyramid where the Pope can dictate everything. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Ask a provincial or a superior house, superior of a, of a religious community, how much power he has. <laughs> to the contrary, we have a huge diffusion and a, a lack of clarity in rules and responsibilities that have brought about have fostered a climate of abuse. Precisely because nobody was clearly responsible for this subject, for this father, for this parish priest. Because there were a religious in a, in a diocese working for a charity. Now, who is the boss of this guy? And then go on, sending him to another country, to another continent with a third bishop and a, a second provincial, and who is looking after him? In this statement report from the Netherlands, for the first time, that was maybe almost um, 10 years ago now, it, it was brought about clearly that in, in the Catholic Church we have a huge lack of clarity in the uh, order of command, if you wish. And, as we will see, there are other problems connected to that. So, these are a, a number of paradoxes that I see. Others are the following. We are dealing in the Catholic Church since 35 years now and more with the publicly known cases of child sexual abuse. What has happened since then? In most countries, it has been the topic, the dealing with the cases and with victims and with their families and has been delegated to two professional groups, lawyers and canon lawyers and psychologists and psych psychiatrists. What has been left out is the theological reflection and that is why I'm so grateful that Professor Fagioli has invited me here because this is the start of a conversation about the theological implications of this. The core business of the church, why do we believe in God and what do we say and understand from God and of God, has been left out in front of something that is weighing on our shoulders and our hearts for more than 35 years publicly known. How come that female and male theologians, for all those decades, didn't engage in that. You hardly find any literature on this. Why? In liturgy, do we have prayers that reflect the sorrow, the hurt, the anger, the pain, the hopelessness, and the hope of survivors and victims and their relatives? Do we have that? How often do we pray for them? And have we found a way to express our concerns and our discomfort with this in prayer with the Lord? How often do you pray about that? And ask him to give you some advice on that? Now, 
bit more difficult maybe to explain is that the supposedly omnipotent bishops and priests feel very powerless in this moment. Because they find themselves hugely under pressure by media and by survivors who are very vocal. Not all of them are very vocal and very aggressive, but there are some of them. And ask any bishop, any vicar general, any priest who has to deal with such situations, they will feel helpless and hopeless. Then, go through the streets of um, Melbourne or Dublin, and where's this one? People may insult you may spit at you. In the English-speaking world, you have now the word non-offending priests for those who have not yet committed a crime. <laughs> there is a general suspiciousness. Understandable, yes. But this is the, the feeling, the state of the mood uh, in which many priests worldwide find themselves. And they say, what, what, why me? Why, why did, how did I come in that position? And they feel very awkward in being with young people. And they don't know how to behave anymore. That may be a reason why 30% of candidates to the epi uh, episcopacy decline being appointed bishops as has said Cardinal Lulet in four weeks ago in an interview. I was surprised to see that, but 30% of those who in the imagination of people could be the princes of the church decline to be in that position. Because, as an auxiliary bishop in Germany told me years ago, it's no fun to be a bishop anymore. <laughs> And you can see, if you look into the world, that especially in those areas where um, the church was omnipotent or were perceived as such, it turns to the opposite. Countries like Ireland or Quebec or the Catholic pockets in, uh, in Australia have lost almost all connection with the Catholic Church. And I fear that in some parts of Eastern Europe that may happen again. So you see that um, uh, we are certainly worldwide at a very important point in our history. Um, and many people tend to uh, just shut their eyes, their ears, they want to go on, or they leave the church. And um, that is certainly not an option for me, as um, we have seen in the church history, and Massimo, you may connect, correct me, but um, as far as I know, in the church never has come about a real reform, a lasting reform, top down. I believe, as far as I know church history, that the big reforms in the church always came from bottom up. Benedict of Nursia, 5th century. Francis, 11th, 12th century. Francis of Assisi. Ignatius Loyola, Teresa of Avila, 16th century. And all the foundresses and founders of the new congregations in the 19th century, almost all of them, I mean, at least the foundresses, certainly, were lay people. And they didn't wait for Rome to solve the problem. They didn't wait until their spirituality could find a new path in a very difficult situation. I mean, the church has seen such situations, I believe, every two or three hundred years in its history. And the solution didn't never, at least in those moments, come from Rome. Never from the central government. And 
hardly ever from, from bishops. So what is, um, what is the result of this situation? It has been called a traumatization of systems. Now, what is meant by the term that I have taken from this lady, German lady who has written, not many people have reflected on this. If there is a big organization and there is this something happening as I have described and as we all of us live through, then this is perceived as an objective and or subjective threat to the life or security experienced by the individual members of the institution and as an ex existential threat to the institution itself. Now take especially those who represent that institution, in our case, the bishops. At the same time, there's an excessive de demand on the institutional ca capabilities of coping. It's flooded. I mean, I've seen this 10 years ago when the scandal was unfolding in Germany. And you could see how the bishops' conference was overwhelmed by the news that broke day after day after day, for half a year, day after day, first page, front line, da da da, again and again and again. And it, was, it created a climate of shock and paralysis. And that leads, in a systemic view, to the splitting up of the traumatic event. In individual traumatic experiences, when you, when you have an accident or when there's an earthquake or where whatever, huh? the trauma is split off in the brain so that it doesn't intervene in your day-to-day -day functioning. So it is cut off and uh, you build a wall around it so that it doesn't... Uh, um, continuously break up and make you dysfunctional. The cost to that is that a, t a part of your brain is, is split off and a part of your experience world is split off. And my thesis is that the same has happened for the whole church. Since we have traumatized, severely traumatized individual <coughs> members Survivors of abuse, secondary survivors means family, relatives, friends, parish members, school colleagues, and so forth. Traumatized. This has been split off in the church perception. Understandably, because it is so disturbing. On one hand. On the other. Who, if not us, should have the courage and the capacity to face it? and to work through that. So, what does such a traumatization bring about? The undermining of the institutional self-perception. An existential threat and the avoidance of responsibility. The sense of institutional powerlessness and individual disappointment. I've already spoken about the paralysis. The paralysis that you can see and, and you can touch it with your hands. That people have no creativity anymore. They are like in a tunnel. No way out. And energy is bound. And you don't see where, where it, does it flow? Where, where does it go? It is somehow lost. Then sometimes this institution perceives and presents itself as the victim. We are attacked. Why don't you look to the others? And so forth and so forth. Then you cut off, literally, the traumatic documentation. The documentation of the trauma. You, you don't... Um, put the documents in the archives, or you don't write the proper documents, you don't produce the reports, 
or you don't keep them, you destroy them. Again, let us forget, more or less consciously. Then, the refusal to cooperate in detecting injuries, because it would add to the harm, add to the pain, add to the anger, add to the hopelessness. Which can lead to the state of, we can't do anything, systemic paralysis, or institutional overreaction, running after every piece uh, of uh, information and trying to do, uh, to show that you are doing everything right but not because you are motivated by some sound uh, willingness uh, to take on the different issues that are combined, but simply to comply with law and to show to the public the nice face, we do what we need to do. Not because you are personally convinced you need to do it. And the moment you think public doesn't look anymore, okay, you go on. trivializing or denying the facts and the institutional responsibility. Limitations to the capacity of self-purifying and living. And passing on of traumatization. We have just seen studies in Germany and in Switzerland about uh, the impact of the post-war <coughs> traumatization by a million German women who were raped by the Soviets in, uh, in 1945 and following. And how that was passed on to their daughters and so forth. Um, so, when we have generations of victim survivors in the church, sexual abuse, how has this been passed on to their family members? Now, this is a very big picture, isn't it? So, Many people who I meet and who work in the area of safeguarding find themselves in what is called safeguarding fatigue. In your country, you have, I, I would say, one of the top three uh, systems of formation, of guidelines, uh, of uh, attention, of awareness that is uh, given to the area of safeguarding worldwide. You are certainly among the three best. Every par parishioner, parishioner, volunteer, every priest, every bishop has to undergo continuous training on that. You, you cannot function as a priest if you have not done your yearly formation sessions on this topic. You have very strict guidelines in a university that, like this. I, I think you have lots of offices for that. You have clear instructions what to do. No other institutions, or not many in this country, and certainly not abroad, would have such a high standard. Nevertheless, every single case of one former priest who has abused 50 years ago destroys the work and the confidence and in the, in the safeguarding of the present institution, so that those who work presently on this feel devastated. They feel as if it's Sisyphus work. You, you can do whatever you wish, it's never enough. It's like a hole you can throw in millions of water, nothing is kept there. And that is very, very um, sad for those people who with all their heart want to do something for a better and a safer church. <coughs> now, I think there has been some attempt to uh, reply to that in the meeting of the Presidents of the Bishops' Conferences, PBC, um, in uh, 21st and 24th of February last year, called by Fran Pope Francis, also unique in church history. Never anything like that had happened. For three days, he called um, the presidents of 118 bishops' conferences, the heads of the Oriental churches, the heads of the dicasteries in, uh, in the Vatican government, 
representation of male and female religious congregations. So the whole church leadership, a little <coughs> council for three days only on this. And uh, I was called by the Pope together with Cardinal Supic, Archbishop Shikluna, and Cardinal Gracious from Mumbai, Bombay, um, to organize that meeting. And we, we proposed to the Pope that we would look into the systemic issues. And he agreed. So the three days had the following topics, responsibility, accountability, and transparency. Now, responsibility, responsibility, what does a bishop need to know in terms of canon law and in terms of civil state law? Accountability, if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, who, to whom is he accountable? Now, there were four languages in which the conference took place. English, Spanish, French, and Italian. And when we tried to translate from the English accountability into the other three languages, the word, the noun, more precisely, the noun accountability, you don't find an equivalent in any of the three. And the same would be true for Portuguese. Now, all these four, French, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese are the Catholic languages. And you don't have a noun equivalent to accountability in those languages. And that is not the fault of the church, by the way. <laughs> it says much about the culture. I live for 20 years now in Rome. And I can tell you that the idea of accountability is foreign to Italians. Except Massimo, of course. <laughs> At least Romans. I, I should be more precise. Uh, Southern Italians, right? Okay. <laughs> you, you always find a way out. And you can always uh, throw away and point to others and so. It is, it is perfect. The system there is perfect. You, you avoid to be put on the spot. This is the first rule for your life. I'm not responsible. So imagine that this culture is very present in the, in the Catholic Church. It is very much entrenched in it. And to introduce something like that, what a real accountability is, is not easy. Transparency internally, how, for example, the rights of victims in a church trial, how do we define that? is not defined well enough. And external transparency, how do we deal with media? Many bishops worldwide fear media like the devil. There were survivors present, and we had asked for video testimony and audio testimonies of survivors. And um, that is why I would say this event was successful. Much has been written about uh, it immediately after that, and I personally could uh, certainly find uh, nothing wrong with those reports, very much criticizing it. Mm. Now I would say we were wrong, because it has brought about a lot of change. The first outcome was that you could see bishops leaving the hall after, for example, an evening prayer where a survivor of abuse had shared his or her story. And they, would, they had, literally, many of them had tears in their eyes. And they were shaking hands and embracing um, those victims. Uh, but how do you measure that? I'm convinced, and I've spoken with a good number, months after that meeting, that this was the most single most important uh, emotional event for them listening really in a prayerful atmosphere with other bishops present to survivors who speak about their hurt and their expectations and hope for the church. And then we have had a number of norms. So we have change of attitude, which you hardly can measure, but then we have norms, and we have a good number of norms. 
I can say honestly, many more changes have happened than I had expected and anticipated. That started in March with a new Vatican City State law and the introduction of guidelines for the Vatican City State. Now, that is the smallest state in, in the world, but it is the state that represents mostly and most the Catholic Church. So it is in, indicative about that. In June, a new law came into uh, existence um, with a nice title. Our laws have nice titles. Vos estis lux mundi, you are the light of the world. <coughs> and, surprise, surprise, the most important thing it speaks about is the accountability among bishops. I don't think you are um, uh, so much interested in the, the details of that, but it is a very first step to introduce accountability among bishops, because until then, 1st of June, basically every bishop was accountable only to one person in this world. To God, yes, eh? but to one person in this world, and that was a man in white, the Bishop of Rome. To no other, no president of a bishop's conference, no metropolitan, no nothing could say anything about the behavior of a bishop, except if he committed a serious crime. Then, of course, there, is, there are means already. But for the first time, for negligence or cover-up, we have an introduction of first steps of uh, um, measures of accountability, and they work. The term vulnerable persons in, was introduced. Again, I would say this is the first step of something that needs to be clarified because nobody knows exactly what a vulnerable person is. No legislation, no professional group has a very clear understanding of, of that. How can we have that? But it is at least um, acknowledging that there are not only minors that need to be protected. And there is a general duty to report abuse, sexual abuse and abuse of power and abuse of conscience to the church authorities. For this is a duty for all clergy and all religious. For the first time, female religious are also included as those who need to report and as those who can be reported. Until now, until June, it was only male clergy. Hmm? that could be um, prosecuted because of those crimes. For the first time, female religious are in the picture now. And then, on 17th of December, the Pope himself decided on abolishing the Pontifical Secret in its application to uh, uh, abuse cases. Child sexual exploitation material online is considered now um, is punishable if it shows youth up to the age of 18, before it was 14, and qualified lay canonists can be included uh, in uh, church trials. Uh, so this, this is the systemic response, as I see, to the systemic challenges. This is not Perfect, and this is certainly something that needs to be followed through, but it is, for me, a sign that the system, and at the top, has understood the message, and that there is a movement forward. What is this movement showing uh, now is one thing, but what should be following is something that is very much needed, and, and you can feel that in many parts of the world and, and among many people, the separation of powers. A bishop, according to our structure, is everything for the diocese. He's the legislator, he's the judge, he, he's the leader in, in all areas of power. That cannot be healthy. So, how do we define responsibilities and accountability? Where does professional expertise come in? without putting some theological or spiritual source over that. 
Is it possible? I, I feel more and more bishops are willing to transfer power and control to others because they realize that they can't do it and they are not expected to control and supervise everything. How do we struggle to find solutions together? How can we disagree with respect with each other? And a, a completely a new topic would be, and I could go on for this because I come from that area, the formation and the education, the training of church personnel, especially of religious and priests. There are many areas that we need to attend to. So, I think a core question for the church in this country and in other parts of the world is that we hold together what has been split. Norms need to be introduced, and they have been, but there needs also to be a change in attitude because you can introduce every law you wish. If people don't buy it, if they don't want to comply with it, it's paper, nothing more. How can Canon law and theology work, for example, on a different model of priesthood, of um, bishophood. How do justice and mercy come together? Working hand in hand, clergy and laity. I see that many very committed lay people in your in your country and elsewhere, are so much dismayed with what they see from the leadership that they say, we, either we move away or we, we do it our way. I don't think this is, in the long run, a good solution. I understand that, but I don't think this is healthy for both sides. Diocese and religious orders working together. Where does this happen? In this country, it didn't happen. Because the orders, the religious congregations, followed a different policy with regard to perpetrators than the bishops did. Now, this creates double standards. This creates um, frictions and tensions, necessarily. So how can we have a unity in diversity, a, com a real communion? Only if we respect each other and listen to each other. And I would say this is a part uh, and parcel of what I could call a, a new asceticism, a new ascetic virtue, trying to live community and union, and not insisting only that in, in the bubble in which I live, everything is right and the others are wrong. In theology, and I'm coming to a closure, hmm? in theology, I'm also a theologian, so I, I'm really, I don't really know what to say. Why did, over decades, theologians not ask such questions? Or at least they didn't write about that. Maybe they asked them, but I, I don't see the answers they found. How come that God puts us in this moment of history, in this situation, that we are here not talking about <laughs> Teresa of Avila's interior castle? or other nice things that we could share. But why are we here? And to what does he call us now, us? If he is the Lord of history and of his church, there must be a plan. We don't know what this plan is, and we, we wish he had another plan for us, but here we are. So who do we want to be as a church? And who should the ministers in this church be? And what should they do? My Jesuit companion, Jim Keenan, has written recently uh, on the theology of vulnerability that comes as a surprise to us. And, and, we, and we, we think, well, in, in whom do we believe as Christians? We believe 
in Jesus, who made himself vulnerable. He left his being God, says the letter to the Philippians 2. He leaves his Godhead and comes to be like us, vulnerable like us, exposing himself to death. We believe in one who, who shows the wounds of the crucifixion even when he is risen. So how can we have forgotten that? Which also means we need to think about the spirituality of power and powerlessness. Seemingly there is in the church the tendency over, over decades and hundreds of years to accumulate that sense of we are entitled to this position and to this power. Forgetting where we come from. We come from the cross. But there, is, there seems to be so much of human, humanness of the, call it, original sin in us that <coughs> inevitably leads us to this kind of uh, forgetting about the roots of our existence. So we want to, to reflect on that, uh, and I'm very happy that uh, Massimo will be with us, with the permission of the president, of course. <laughs> Uh, at, the, at the conference that we will have at the Gregorian in, uh, in six weeks' time, uh, Theology in the Face of Abuse. Uh, and I believe, honestly, I believe this is the very first conference on systematic theology on an international level, systematic theology. There may have been moral or, or spiritual, but systematic theology reflects on questions like what do we, how do we understand our redemption? What images of the church do we have? How do we understand priesthood, etc.? Okay. Um, I want to conclude with this because, um, I mean, with this, comma, um, because I, this leads me to the two minutes of publicity here. Uh, this is the break, the commercial break now. Um, because what I say uh, is not only my reflection, but it is the result also of the work of our team at the Center for Child Protection, um, as has been explained. That is a, a center that was established eight years ago, precisely, um, at the Gregorian University in Rome. And we offer e-learning um, programs for mainly Catholic institutions in, um, uh, in all, basically in all continents, in different languages, um, in cooperation with the partners. So we offer units on how do you detect abuse, what do you do with a perpetrator, how uh, can you support survivors, etc., etc. So, but then the cooperating partner institution needs to supply also face-to-face -face sessions. Um, we organize conferences and we do research, for example, in the area of online abuse, which is at the moment, in, to the best of my knowledge and my uh, experience, the most, the biggest threat to children's security is the internet. And uh, we have a diploma course uh, of one semester that runs in English and for next year on also in Spanish um, for safeguarding personnel of institutions, of dioceses, of provinces, of schools, and so forth. We have a master's program in safeguarding and we have had uh, already a, a certain number of doctorates in um, these areas that have not been researched until now and we continue to expand our um, work. We are a small team, but I think we, uh, have, uh, we have at least the, the commitment that we want to, to snowball out information and awareness to other parts of the world. If you wish, you can uh, inform yourself with, uh, those, on those websites. Um, 
and this is uh, the main building of our campus that is nothing compared to Villanova campus, of course. <laughs> um, I uh, thank you for your attention and I thank you especially for uh, what I perceive, at least from here, as um, your, your willingness to, to delve into that and to stay with that, um, which is the perseverance that we need. And I thank you also for your patience and for your prayers. No, you can't, you can't describe it, what it means, but there is no noun that would render the, the idea. No, accountability as such, there is no noun for that. Yeah, but you have three words for that. There is no, no single noun for that. Hmm? Uh, Father, uh, uh, my name is Father Gonzalez. Uh, I spent 20 years in Peru working on this issue as a uh, psychotherapist oriented in psychoanalysis. I tried to as much as possible to reach the lay population in Lima. And uh, unfortunately, the biggest paralysis came from the clergy, came from the church. And uh, my experience of the fear of the laity, because it is also an issue in the families, and it's quite frequent, indeed is fear, is terror, my question is, and I, uh, I think all of this experience that we are all living through, if we are able to get beyond our paralysis and uh, be able to understand and be able to think, the big question for me is, what do we do about the laity? It's very, it's almost as though the entire focus is on the church. And this service, yes, is on the church. Uh, but as you mentioned, it is a, uh, a challenge. It is a call to each and every one of us to be able to work this out, to understand it, so that we not be paralyzed. The question is, pastorally, what about the legacy? Hello, my name is Maciel, I'm from Honduras, which is like 99% Catholic, so this is very relevant. My question to you is, what are the proactive um, measures that are being taken? Though I'm glad that there's more accountability, all of the measures that you mentioned seem more reactive to me than proactive. Yeah, okay. Um. As I said, I was uh, last weekend. I was in Lima uh, with uh, the bishops' conference, and that was interesting because it was like a U um, as they they were sitting, and on that side uh, there were. <laughs> that's a strange thing to say, but uh, there were bishops, al almost all of them younger than me. They were appointed over the last five years. 
And in many of them came then personally to me and afterwards and, and shared with, with me their concerns and their openness and their need to receive also uh, some support in, for example, uh, finding laity that is competent in certain areas. Now, you know that in, in Lima you can find all kinds of experts, including trauma therapists, but go to Piura or, or on 4,000 meters altitude uh, and uh, far away from any bigger city and any university or whatever, and you have no competent personnel there. So how, how can, and what does a bishop's conference in that case uh, uh, necessarily need to supply in brackets, in brackets, just to show a little bit of the, what is really going on out there, in brackets, a bishop shared with me that in his diocese there are shamans who commit human sacrifices to this very day. So they kill people for better weather or whatever in our present day. Normally this, this will be children yeah, who will be killed. So, in pre I mean, there are situations that from the way and the world in which we live, we have little understanding. Now, if I understood your, your question uh, well, is um, how can we help the families? And it is true that 95% of abuse, sexual abuse of minors happens in the context of families. Every researcher knows that. 95% of all abuse happens in the context of the family. And 5% in all institutions together, including the churches. And no church is exempt from that. And no religion is exempt from that. All, all researchers know that. So my point in uh, helping uh, proactively uh, to take on, um, to get out of the paralysis um, on the bishop's side is who feel so overwhelmed and helpless as I can testify. I mean, in, in many examples that I could give is, is that I say if we do what we can and what we should, if we listen to our Lord, then the church could be a much more credible leader in the area of safeguard. And not only our institutions that would be safe and are safe. I mean, in your country, probably no other institution is as safe as a Catholic school in this moment. Um, but it is not seen and it is not perceived because of uh, all what has been mishandled and is still mis being mishandled in dealing with the cases from the past. On the other side, if we take on this as an issue in which we can support families to be as stable and safe and healthy as they could and should be, that is one of the core missions of the church, isn't it? The pastoral work for the families. So combine that with safeguarding. Bring it into the picture of uh, the pastoral work for um, the health uh, and, and the stability of families. And yeah, you, immediately you have a combination that would help us also to be much more proactive. Again in brackets. I believe that the Catholic Church is doing much more for the safety of children in countries like India than any other organization, including the state. But that goes unnoticed. Um, why? Because of, of all the crimes that have happened and, and probably are happening still now. So if, if we really uh, get together our act here, we can do much for the best of humanity at large because no other organization has as much outreach as we have in terms of schools and so forth. We have 220,000 schools alone worldwide. We have 1,500 universities worldwide. So what, what 
a treasure that could be for the safety of children. If we focused on that, and if we invested in that, and if we trained people in that, and we put competent people in that. Now, much of that happens in some parts of the world. Many people don't perceive that. And in your country, I mean, you are a perfect example for that, because um, where is Bernie? Is Bernie here? Hello? So the head of the, of the USCCB safeguarding office, or whatever, this is not the right... <laughs> say, say it correctly, please. Secretary for Child and Youth Protection. Yeah, so... Uh, I mean, what, what, what they do since, since uh, decades is enormous. But uh, this is washed away. And this is proactive work. The introduction of guidelines, the, the training programs, the preparation of personnel. Uh, I mean, this is not not only reactive now, it looks forward and it prepares a better future. And that is where we need to invest more, at least in, in our ranks. Yeah? I think we can do also much more beyond our ranks. Um, and we have all the capacities to do.